Well, hello everybody and welcome to our latest Roadmap to Recovery webinar, where we're finding out 10 things we didn't know about Australia, New Zealand and Fiji. We're excited to bring together three of our favourite tourist boards from the Oceania region. So joining me today, we've got Kate Fenton, UK Trade Manager for Tourism New Zealand. Hi, Kate. Hello. And next, we've got Pete Mills, Partnerships and Distribution Manager for Tourism Australia. Hi, Pete. Hi there. And last but not least, we've got Jane West, Regional Manager for the UK and Europe at Tourism Fiji. Welcome, Jane. Uh, Bula, everyone. Now, they've got some fantastic fun facts to share with us about the region, uh, but they've also got together and come up with some amazing goodies to give away. There are four hampers up for grabs, each of them including a bottle of small batch distillery gin from Australia. Thanks, Pete. Uh, a gorgeous bottle of New Zealand wine from Kate and some tropical body products and eco-friendly goodies from Fiji, courtesy of Jane. So all you have to do is keep watching and listening out for some of the information they'll be sharing with us today. And you'll find the questions and details of how to enter at the end. Now, let's kick off with our 10 things you didn't know about Australia, New Zealand and Fiji with Pete, who's going to talk to us about the best Aussie beaches. So Australia is famed for its amazing beaches and coastal environment, but if you went to a different beach every single day, it would take you nearly 30 years to visit them all. So Australia is home to nearly 36,000 kilometres of coastline and is home to some of the whitest sands in the world. And you'll find this at Lucky Bay in Esperance in Western Australia and also in Jarvis Bay, New South Wales. And it's the only place in the world where two World Heritage sites sit side by side, where the Daintree Rainforest meets the Great Barrier Reef in far north Queensland. Brilliant. Um, and next we'll cross over to Kokomo Island in Fiji to hear from the resort's marine biologist. My name is Kleena O'Flaherty and I am one of the marine biologists here at Kokomo Private Island in Fiji. I'm here today to tell you all about the Kandavu region and the beautiful Great Astrolabe Reef and what amazing marine life is on offer down here. So Kokomo is based in the northern part of the island group known as Kandavu. Kandavu is the fourth largest island group in Fiji and it's surrounded by the Great Astrolabe Reef. And the Great Astrolabe Reef, it's a continuous barrier reef that runs along the eastern side of Kandavu and also parts of the western side. There are some amazing marine life on offer here and amazing dive sites. We have over 30 dive and snorkel sites that we can offer our guests here. And you're pretty much guaranteed to see a white tip reef shark or a green turtle and beautiful tropical reef fish anywhere you jump in along here. The reef itself is dominated by hard corals, but there are some beautiful lush soft corals on the deeper passageways and outer walls as well. You've got loads of different types. You've got swim throughs, there's passageways, shallow coral reefs, and amazing drift opportunities for all types of divers down here. So some more rare species that you may have a chance to encounter include scalloped hammerheads, silver tip reef sharks, um, gray reef sharks, the Napoleon wrasse, uh, eagle rays, hawksbill turtles, and in the right season, you have a great chance of seeing the reef manta ray. So what people may not know is that Kandavu has the largest reef manta ray population in Fiji that we know of so far. And with our collaborative work with the Manta Project Fiji, we've helped identify over 100 individuals into the database. And what's one really special thing about Fiji and, and the Kandavu is we have, a, we have a large portion of melanistic manta rays, and these are the black manta rays. So these are quite rare anywhere else in the world, but you have a good chance of seeing them here as about 50 percent of the population has this melanistic or black manta and um, what we here at Kokomo promote is sustainable manta interactions or encounters and what we do is it means you can have a chance of maybe seeing five to anything up to 20 individuals all at once but only having a small number of people maybe four or five people in the water at the same time this keeps it really intimate for the manta for the guests and keeps the mantas nice and chilled out so we've been, we're very lucky and we've been recognized as a sustainable Manta operator by the Manta Trust. And there's only a couple of operators that have this recognition. So we're super excited to have you guys back in Fiji. We're ready and waiting. And we can't wait for you to come and explore the Great Astrolab Reef and Kandavu with us. So tatale. Now from conservation in marine areas to conservation on land. Uh, Kate, tell us a little bit about New Zealand's latest sustainability focus.
Yeah, I chose to um, bring the Tiaki Promise um, to highlight today. And um, Tiaki Promise, uh, Tiaki translates as care and to care for land, uh, people and place. Um, it's an industry-wide initiative that was um, created a couple of years back now. Um, and it's about helping people travel um, in New Zealand in a really responsible way. Um, so um, the fun fact, because I always get asked what these mean behind me, um, and they are the Tiaki Promise, it's the emblem. Um, and the top one is uh, Ranginui, our Sky Father. The middle one um, is Tani Mahuta, uh, which uh, represents our native forest. Uh, and this is one of the largest curry trees um, in New Zealand, uh, the largest curry tree. The next one is, I always get this wrong, Papatuanuku, um, which is our Earth Mother. And uh, then we have Tangaroa, which means um, and translates for our oceans, uh, lakes, and, and our water, and our rivers. So the Tiaki Promise is a really um, helpful way of um, guiding people around New Zealand, agents from five rivers and sources um, on the Tiaki Promise. And um, it's about um, keeping New Zealand clean, traveling respectfully, and, um, and being prepared when you go out into the, the native New Zealand. So um, that's the one I would highlight today. Pete, tell us a little bit more about the weird and wonderful wildlife we can find in Australia. Yeah, and I mean, it's one of the more unique selling points for Australia. So Australia was cut off from the mainland over 30 million years ago, and that's what created our weird and wonderful wildlife, and it evolved uh, following that. Um, but many people who travel down to Australia to see the wildlife should be aware that actually they can't see the wildlife all over the country because specific um, animals are specific to specific regions. For example, koalas can only be found from... Adelaide and up to and up, up the East Coast and uh, likewise our quokka, the world's happiest animal, uh, can only be found on Rottnest Island just outside of uh, um, opposite Perth in Western Australia and uh, our Tassie devil, the Tasmanian, de Tasmanian devil, uh, can only be found in Tasmania. So when you're sending people down to Australia, choose carefully where they go to see them. Australian Wildlife Journeys is a collective that's brought together a series of specialist wildlife tour operators that showcase wildlife in the wild experiences or responsible wildlife travel encounters. Our small group experiences, they cater to a whole host of passion points, whether you're into photography, bird watching, diving, snorkeling, uh, we can cater to those wildlife connoisseurs combined with that famous Australian hospitality, premium hospitality. Uh, in addition to this, uh, we offer all sorts of experiences across Australia, uh, from whale shark encounters uh, in world famous Ningaloo, all the way down to southwest Western Australia, maybe to see blue whales and orcas, maybe up to far north Queensland to see our most biodiverse area in Australia, up in the beautiful Daintree National Park, or maybe down in Tasmania to see the amazing marsupials, including the Tassie devil, uh, wombats and quolls. Yes, yeah, so this is something that's come about really in the last year as people have pivoted, you know, to support themselves um, during a drop in tourism um, during COVID times. And, you know, I can see it really being appealing to future visitors of Fiji. Fiji isn't just known for its beaches. Topographically, it's volcanic, very lush and lots of valleys and and fresh water streams and rivers but lots of forest and you can go hiking and in the last year um, a new collection has has been formed called the Duavata collection. Duavata means do it together in Fiji and it's a collection of about 12 different experiences and properties that lend themselves more to the preservation of culture, it's demonstrating leadership and tradition, lots of eco experiences and protecting cultural heritage. But one of the nice projects that I've been keeping a close eye on is Coco Mana, which is located in a forest forested area right behind the Bay of Savu Savu on Vanua Levu, which is the second largest island to the north of Viti Levu. And it's a beautiful deep water bay with marine reserves. Um, Jean-Michel Cousteau, for example, has a resort there. It's a great place to visit and one of the best pearl farms in the world. 
but right behind uh, there's a new um, organization um, which has set up the production of chocolate so no one really appreciates that you can eat chocolate in Fiji but you can go and watch the whole process from growing right through to fermenting and the eventual production um, but right behind this this wonderful um, operation is an agroforestry project so you can go and discover maybe 30 different species of trees and this is one of many that's cropping up all over Fiji, excuse the pun. <laughs> Yeah, New Zealand was um, the first country um, in the world to um, identify a geographical feature as a legal um, entity, as a legal identity. Um, there's a couple, and but um, the one I've, I picked out today is in uh, the Whanganui River. So in 2017, um, Parliament um, granted an act to uh, protect and to um, give it a, a legal persona, if you like. And um, what that does is mean that there are guardians that represent um, voice um, uh, for the river itself. Um, and it helps um, conserve and protect the river um, for future generations. Uh, the river itself, the more I've read about this, because this is an area of New Zealand that I haven't actually been to, there's many, but um, the more I've read about it, the more drawn I am to this river. It's 180 um, miles long and it goes from the Tongariro National Park, so from Mount Tongariro, which a lot of people know for its famous day hike, um, right um, heads a bit northwest, um, centre of the North Island we're talking, uh, and then cuts um, down southwest towards um, the coastal town of Tonganui. Anything with a WH um, is FF in uh, New Zealand, Tonganui. A lot of people would still call it Wanganui. Um, either, either work. And the, um, the river itself is actually one of our great walks. So there's some fantastic great walks of New Zealand. Um, and you can find a lot more about that on our Department of Conservation website um, and newzealand.com. But they've actually created the Whanganui journey as one of our great walks and you do it by paddle. So you can do it by canoe or by kayak. It's about 145K of the, um, the river. And it's a five-day multi-adventure camping or glamping along the along the road, and you just you get the most majestic, um, native, and and really incredibly authentic experience. Um, and it it's always led by Maori guides, so you learn a lot about the myths and the legends of the river itself, um, and the conservation of the river. Um, and it looks to me like one of, I guess New Zealand's one of the lesser, lesser known regions, but it looks to me like one of the most, I guess, immersive experiences you can do to really understand how um, and connect to um, this piece of land that New Zealand is, is doing so much to protect. So, um, so that's the one I picked today um, for, to, to go and experience the Whanganui uh, River and, and maybe take yourself out on a five day hike paddle um, and go and experience um, some of the lesser known parts of New Zealand. Well, let's head over and see uh, what that experience is actually like from one of those guardians that you mentioned. Good morning, world. E re re kau wana te awa nui mai te kāhui maunga ki tangaroa ko au te awa ko te awa ko au. There flows the great waters of the Whanganui River from the mountain to the sea. I am the river and the river is me. It's really important that as a river people, our connection to why, our connection to water, is our connection to life. And in that way, connecting us from the river to the ocean and the world and beyond, we are the people of the river. No mai ki te ao o te awa o wanganui. Te ora. Now, Pete, let's come back to you to talk about another uh, key driver of travel to Australia, and that's its famous food and drink, um, one of the, the best things that you can experience over there. I'm just going to focus on wine because who doesn't like a glass of wine, right? Um, so Australia has around 4% of the world's wine production. Yet the little known fact is that the world's fifth largest wine exporter. And I know actually during pandemic that uh, they're exporting more to the UK than they've ever done before. Um, so Australia is made up of 65 wine regions uh, ranging from uh, southern Queensland um, on the east coast of Australia uh, to Tasmania right down in the south to Margaret River over in the west. And that covers around two and a half thousand wine estates, wineries. Um, and I, I'm not sure if um, everybody knows, but the ultimate winery experience of Australia is a collective of premium award-winning wineries that offer the best, most exclusive wine experiences. And with 26 members across six states, 
from regions, they not only give you the chance to enjoy these outstanding wines in the most amazing settings, but they also provide beyond the cellar door experiences and including wine blendings and fine dining. So as a uh, travel agent, please go check out the website uh, of Ultimate Wine Experiences of Australia. Well, every time's a good time to be in Fiji, but I'm just drawing on on something that, that was quite unique that I, I did personally on a particular trip. I'm always asked, you know, which is your favourite part of Fiji or can you think of one experience you enjoyed the most? And I'd say that this was quite high on the list. So I talked about the Duvata collection earlier and, and one of the resorts that, that's within this collection um, is called Takalana Bay. And um, the this particular resort um, sits close to the Half Moon Reef and at, at full moon you can go out with a fisherman locally and you can swim amongst the dolphins within this Half Moon Reef and you know for me that that was just such a unique and special experiences uh, it's a unique experience um, and you know there are other things that take place at full moon not necessarily at night at full moon but um, during the day at full moon, you can take part or watch the festival of the Bololo where little worms come up from the coral floor and come to the surface only at particular times in October and November and they're harvested and cooked and eaten. Um, and another thing that you can do, of course, is being on the water and Leluvia Resort uh, offers Drua experiences. So Indrua is a traditional Fijian sailing canoe and, you know, there's some wonderful footage of, of sailing along of full moon where it looks like daylight or sunset it's a great experience but the locals you know will always give you little tips about what you can and can't do at full moon and one of the things is that you can plant um, low-hanging fruit at full moon that's an optimum time to do so let's hand over to Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand where we're going to find out a little bit more about the new public holiday of Matariki well, now we're joined by Kylie Rufi Karawana, Director of Horizon Tours in Dunedin. Welcome, Kylie. Thanks for joining us. Kia ora. Thank you for having me. Now, we hear that New Zealand has a new public holiday in its calendar, which I'm sure is very exciting news for everyone. And it's to celebrate Matariki. But that isn't a word that we're very familiar with here in the UK. So tell us a little bit about it and its cultural significance. Well, the full name is actually Ngā Mata Ariki o Tāwhirimātia which is a little bit more of a mouthful than just Matariki. And it means the eyes of our God, Tafirimatia. And it's a constellation that you might know as Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. But for Māori, we know it as Ngā Mata Ariki o Tafirimatia. And when we see that constellation in our dawn skies around about May to July, depending on the full moon or the new moon, uh, when we see that constellation, it's our start of our new year. So what we do is we reflect on the last 12 months we celebrate the now because if there's any a time where we need to celebrate the now, it is now, before we look towards the future. So for Māori, we walk backwards into the future. So we learn from the last 12 months and we celebrate our successes, learn from our mistakes and plan for the next 12 months. Oh, that sounds absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for explaining that. And, and speaking of the, of the night sky, um, one of the activities you offer at Horizon Tours is a stargazing experience. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. What can travellers expect if they book that stargazing activity? And, and why is the South Island such a great place to go stargazing? Oh, Dunedin is one of the best places to go stargazing, I think. And why? Just look over my shoulder. This is actually the Southern Aurora, Aurora Australis. And if she's playing, because she's a little bit shy, but when she's playing, you can see her here in Otakoti, Dunedin. And when you come out with Horizon Tours on our Southern Stargazing Tour, you get to see the realm of Ranginui, our Sky Father. And we bring his realm to life through storytelling, through waiata or songs. And we, we talk and educate people about how Māori navigated using our stars. Because New Zealand was the last landmass to ever be discovered. And Māori were the first to discover it. And they used those stars, the realm of Ranginui, to actually guide them on their journeys to find Aotearoa in New Zealand. So when you come with us, you get to learn a little bit about our Māori history and how we view the stars. And the stars are of us and we are of the stars. Kylie, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Ka kite.
Now we're almost at the end of our time and after so many fun facts about each of your destinations, I would really like to pick up on one theme that I think you all have in common and that's the importance of each of your country's indigenous cultures. It's really something that unites the region um, but also offers that individual local character to each place. Um, so Pete, can you tell us a little bit more about how visitors can learn about and appreciate Aboriginal culture in Australia? Yeah, absolutely. So Australia's Aboriginal culture um, it's the oldest surviving continuous culture in the world, and it's upwards of 60,000 years old. Um, every part of Australia is Aboriginal country, and, and visitors can have a really powerful, enriching Indigenous experience, no matter what part of the country they're in. And I think one of those facts is you, um, people just don't realise that you can actually be right in the middle of a major city like Sydney or Melbourne and have an Indigenous experience. You don't have to be you know, in the red centre. So you can be you know, with one of our operators, Auntie Margaret from Dreamtime, Southern Cross in, in the middle of Sydney and have this amazing experience or right up in the far north of Queensland only about you know the medicine cabinet in in the Daintree Rainforest with uh, Juan Walker from Walker Out Cultural Adventures. Um, it's so diverse so that's one fact I would hopefully uh, impart on you today is that you don't need to be in the outback uh, to have an Indigenous experience. You could be anywhere within Australia. Absolutely. And uh, Jane, uh, we know Fiji is famous for its bula spirit, but I don't know if people necessarily know what that means. So tell us a little bit more. Well, bula means hello, but it, it embraces the way the culture really is. So in other words, you know, it's incredibly welcoming and hospitable and, and said to be the happiest nation in the world, happiest place in the world. And, uh, you know, we always say it's where happiness finds you. It's genuine and it's all part of the community and the sharing beliefs that are ingrained in their culture. There are lots of ways that you can take part, whether you're visiting a village, you know, from your nearby resort or taking part in a cruise culture is always there and you know if you're fortunate enough to be invited to a village and take part in the well-known carver ceremony that you know which really marks the arrival of any guest or visitor is quite special absolutely it sounds it and um, and Kate the importance of the Maori culture has really come through in everything you shared with us today it's in your backdrop it's what you said earlier it's what Kylie was telling us about it's obviously a really core part of why travellers come to New Zealand so tell us a little bit more about that yeah, our Maori culture is integral um, to New Zealand. It's an integral part um, of life in New Zealand. It comes through in everything from our customs, our cuisine, our language, um, our history, our traditions. Um, and uh, there are some key hotspots that people really know and love to go and experience Maori culture. But a bit like Pete, you can really experience the culture anywhere in New Zealand. And that can be anything from visiting a marae, which is a traditional meeting house, you know, seeing a carving, um, you know, experiencing and witnessing a kapahaka, the performing arts, um, even a, a, a hangi and, um, a, and the kind of the more traditional cooking feast. There are so many ways to experience Maori culture in, in New Zealand. Um, and my, my urge would be to any agent and, and therefore their clients um, to just experience it and, and make sure it's such a, um, a huge part of the itinerary. It can be peppered throughout an itinerary, but in all our destinations, I think it's, it's integral um, and it's really important. Um, and it's, it's a really authentic and immersive way to, to see such history and, and traditions in, our, in all of our destinations. So um, it's not to be missed off, uh, off any itinerary, but it's, um, it's just an incredibly um, immersive way to bring an itinerary um, to life. A little bit more, I think. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for um, each giving us such a fantastic update from your countries. It's brilliant to see the region coming together like this and um, certainly lots and lots of really inspiring experiences that you've all outlined today uh, that I'm sure will be making it onto the itineraries of, of many travellers when they are able to return to the region. Uh, now, before we go, we'll just have time to share the questions you'll need to answer to be in with a chance of winning one of those four hampers, a uh, pack full of small batch gin from Australia, wine from New Zealand and spa goodies from Fiji. All you need to do is answer the questions on your screen by going to comp.travelweekly.co.uk stroke Oceania webinar before the closing date of August 31st. But for now, thank you so much to Pete, to Kate and to Jane and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.